everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this live Q&A on COVID-19 with two of our top experts from WHO. My name is Olivia Law Davies. I'm the Regional Communications Manager for WHO in the Western Pacific, a region that includes 37 countries and areas across Asia and the Pacific and is home to more than a quarter of the global population. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Babatunde Oluwakure, who's our Director of Health Security and Emergencies in the Western Pacific, and also Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, WHO's Technical Lead globally for WHO, uh, sorry, for COVID-19, who's normally based in headquarters, but as you can see today, she's here with us in Manila. So over the next 30 minutes or so, um, Babatunde and Maria are going to be answering your questions about COVID-19. And we've already received a number of those through our social media. So thanks to everyone that's already posted. If you haven't already, now is your chance. Um, post your questions in the comments below this live stream. And we'll get to as many as we can in the time available. So let's get started, make the most of the time that we have with our two experts today. A question from Izzy Matias. Does immunity from vaccines wane completely after a certain period of time, or will I have some immunity left at the end of three rounds of vaccination? Maybe I can throw that one to you, Maria, to start with. Sure. Well, thanks for having me in, Wipro. It's a real pleasure to be here with both of you today. Um, so that's a great question. So we know that COVID-19 vaccines are incredibly effective at preventing severe disease and death. And this is important. I think if anyone hears anything today, make sure that you hear that from us um, because they're holding up very, very well. Um, but we measure different things with vaccination. First, we measure against severe disease and death. And as I said, they hold up really well. There is some waning over time, which means there's a reduction in efficacy over time, but they are actually quite robust. We also measure uh, protection against infection. So those are two different types of outcomes. And the COVID-19 vaccines have been developed for really preventing severe disease. They do have some effect at preventing infections, but they don't prevent all infections and they don't prevent all onward transmission. So we do see a waning over time, and this is why people have more than one dose. Um, and as we've entered the third year of this pandemic, we will expect to see some waning. So it depends on the type of vaccine that you had. It depends on how many doses you have. It depends on your age, your underlying condition. So there are a number of factors that we look at when we look at vaccine protection over time. Thanks so much, Maria. It's a really common question. So great to have that answer for everybody out there watching. Um, we have a question from Carolyn Bonquin, who's asking, is WHO seeing another possible surge in low risk countries due to waning vaccine protection? So again, kind of on this vaccine protection, potentially waning over time, um, but particularly asking about potential surges in countries, perhaps in this region. You can speak to that, Babatunde. Uh, thanks very much for that great question, Liv, and also to the, the, the person who asked the question. I, I think this is something that uh, a lot of people want to know. Uh, I think clearly w when we say it'd be good to know what is what people think are low risk countries, I think what we know is that every country is at risk. And so therefore, everybody needs to uh, be vaccinated take up the full uh, dosage, um, whether it's a two dose regimen or a one dose regimen, and then to get their booster doses. I think building on what Maria has already said, uh, very clearly we focus or prioritize the elderly, those who may be immunocompromised, uh, as well as um, our frontline healthcare workers and others who are going to provide services and keep countries running. Uh, and so therefore we, we need to Vaccination, yes, it's great. We will uh, ine inevitably see some surges, but as more and more people are vaccinated, as we follow the um, public health and social measures, and as individual behavior adapts to those measures, and therefore we are more able to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities, the number of surges should decrease and we may then uh, just really need to ensure people are vaccinated, people follow those messages which are going to come from our risk communication and community engagement um, colleagues. And in that way, we reduce the impact or suppress transmission of, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks, Babatunde. And uh, another follow up from Carolyn. What is WHO's position on the administration of a fourth dose? Can I throw that one to you, Maria? 
You can, sure. So, you know, as Babatunde said, um, it's really, really critical that people get vaccinated. Um, COVID-19 is still in a pandemic state. I mean, we're dealing with this at a global level and global problems need global solutions. I mention that because when we look at the use of vaccines, we have to look at vaccines at a global level mm -hmm. and we have to look at vaccines in all countries. And right now we are really not doing enough to be able to get the vaccines to the people who need them most in all countries. Mm -hmm. And the people who need them most in all countries are people over the age of 60, anyone with an underlying condition, um, you know, such as uh, cardiac conditions or immunosuppression, lots of different types of underlying medical conditions and critically our frontline workers. And so when we mention a fourth dose or additional doses, WHO's priority is getting the first and second dose to those who need it in all countries before we start giving more and more and more boosters to people who are already well protected. As Baba Tunde mentioned, we will see surges and, and we are starting to see surges, particularly at a global level. And you've seen quite a, an increase in cases in this region as well. Um, but there's a number of reasons for this, as Baba Tunde said, it's not only one factor. We have the Omicron variant of concern, which is highly transmissible, the most transmissible variant we have seen to date. Mm -hmm. And even within Omicron, we have sublineages that we're tracking, BA.1 and BA.2. Mm -hmm. And BA.2 is even more transmissible than BA.1, but it's not just the variant. It's also looking at vaccine coverage. And so the people we want covered are those who are most at risk. It's not enough to say 70%, 80% or 90% of our population it's covered, who's missing within that 10% or 20% that's missing? And among those people who are missing, who are the ones that are most at risk? And this is what we really need vaccination targets and vaccination campaigns to, to follow. Plus, we can't forget about the public health and social measures. The wearing of a well-fitting mask over your nose, over your mouth, not under your chin, not off the side of your face, not on your elbow, but really wearing a well-fitting mask with clean hands, keeping your physical distancing, improving ventilation, all of these factors matter because all of these are a layered, targeted approach um, that every, every country is using and tailoring it to the basic needs that they have and the trust that they have within their population. So we're not out of the woods yet. We will see the need for additional doses for vaccines as we go forward, but it is absolutely critical that we get those first and second doses to, to everyone in every country before we start giving more and more and more boosters to people who are well protected. Thanks so much, Maria. Great um, comprehensive response there. We've also got a question from Rafi Bossano. Um, what part of the disease spectrum are the majority of cases in the Western Pacific? More cases have been recorded in the past week, but should this be a cause for concern considering the region's vaccination rate? Over to you, Baba uh, Thanks very much for that, Liv. Uh, and also for the question, I, I think, when, when we talk about numbers of, of cases, uh, we, we really need to nowadays be looking at these uh, with a little bit of caution because yes, the numbers are increasing and we, we recognize that, but I think as Maria has said, we are seeing those surges because we are now experiencing Omicron on a, on a wider scale. Uh, and so therefore uh, that would um, count towards the increasing numbers of cases. Additionally, when we uh, look at how those uh, public health and social measures are being implemented. We know that uh, a number of the people or percentage of ICU beds which are occupied and also, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the number of deaths as well. And so therefore using those as a whole in order to then make a public health decision in terms of what should we do next. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Baba Tunde. We have a question from Brian Gavril who asks, any updates on the variant that might come after Omicron? What can we expect? And how can the general public prepare for this? Maria. So this is a great question, Brian. So, you know, the more the virus circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. You've been hearing us say that for, for years now, unfortunately. Um, and it's still true. So Omicron will not be the last variant that we will have to deal with. Um, you know, the virus is spreading at an incredibly intense level with tens of millions of cases being reported each week. Um, we do see a decline in case detection in terms of the amount of testing that is being done. So we think that this is only really the tip of the iceberg as has been since the beginning of this pandemic. But with the virus circulating at such an intense level, 
the virus continues to evolve. It's a natural process mm -hmm. with this virus. So we expect there to be more variants. The question about what will be the next variant, there is some uncertainty. And I think it's really important that we remain humble, humble to this uncertainty. We can make some educated guesses in terms of changes in the spike protein outside of the spike protein. Um, but what we expect for the next variant is that for it to be more fit. It will have to be because it will have to outcompete Omicron, which is circulating its dominant worldwide. So we expect the virus to be more fit, more, more transmissible. What we don't know is if the next variant will be more or less severe. There is no certainty. Some people are speaking with certainty that suggests that the next variant will be less severe. We mm -hmm. don't know that. So we have to prepare for either. Having said that, there's a huge amount of population level immunity at a global level, either from past infection or from vaccination. So we will see less severe disease as we move forward because of the countermeasures that have been put in place. But the variants are the big wild card. What we also don't know is if the next variant will have further immune escape, which would render our vaccines or protection from past infection less effective. So we have to be ready. And this is why surveillance is absolutely critical to continue. Intelligent surveillance, strategic surveillance, making sure that we have good testing, using PCR-based tests, using the antigen-based tests, which are rolled out around the world, and sequencing. Because we, uh, particularly at a global level, with all of our partners around the world, we need to be able to track the changes in the variants. And we need to be able to look at the mutations, we need to look at how the variants behave in terms of the epidemiology and the severity, and really critically, our, the use of our countermeasures. So we work with a technical advisory group for virus evolution, which includes scientists from all over the world, including many from this region. We're so grateful as WHO to our scientific partners um, to keep a handle on it. So now is not the time to give up. Now is not the time to say, you know, the, the pandemic is over, unfortunately. It's not, we, we would give nothing <laughs> more to say that it's over. We really cannot wait to get to that point, but unfortunately it's not. So we have to increase vaccination coverage in those who are most at risk in every single country on the planet, as well as take simple measures to reduce the spread. And that's not lockdown. None of us have said the word lockdown today. What we're talking about is the use of simple tools that can reduce the spread as well as you know keep us and our loved ones safe. Absolutely. And you um, sort of spoke a little bit to one of the questions that is coming through um, from a few different people at the moment, Maria, and I know you've had the question um, before. Um, Abdurrahman Khan, for example, asks, is COVID-19 endemic now? Not yet. Um, this virus is well on its way to becoming endemic. And so we expect that. And, you know, the fact that we will have another endemic virus is really, for me, it, it's a huge tragedy in all of this. Um, endemic does not mean that it's not dangerous. It doesn't mean that it's not deadly. Um, but this is a virus that we that will be with us. The, the opportunity to eradicate or eliminate, you know, really is, is gone. Mm -hmm. um, if it was ever really there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so the virus is well on its way to becoming endemic. Um, the future of this pandemic and, and how we will have to live with it responsibly I really dislike this living, living, with, living with COVID phrase because I think some have used it to give up. Mm. And it doesn't mean we give up. Even if the virus becomes endemic, when the virus becomes endemic, it doesn't mean that we give up because we have tools. We have tools that save people's lives and they're saving lives right now. Mm. So we just need to use these strategically. We need to remain vigilant. Um, and we just need to save so many lives that are, mm. you know, we're losing far too many people unnecessarily. 50 to 70,000 deaths per week that we know about is, is really a tragedy. So there's just a lot more we need to, to do. And we just really need to stay in the fight, live our lives, get our economies back on track, but take measures to keep us safe. And if I could just build on yeah, what Maria has just said, I, I think when, when we use the term endemic as well, we should also not use it as a means of giving up. Right. 
because uh, in many member states, they may say, oh, well, measles is endemic, TB is endemic, and life goes on. Uh, but th th it's not the case with this particular virus, of course, because this one is going to, as we've said already, is going to evolve, it's going to change, and there's a possibility that we will have a variant which is much more uh, lethal uh, than what we currently have, much more transmissible than what we've known previously, and therefore it will test us. Mm. And so I think this virus will continue to test and will continue uh, to challenge us and our health systems, because really our health systems are, the, are what needs to be built up and need to be made more resilient in order for us to deal with what, what is currently happening, what is going to happen in the future in relation to this particular virus and a potential pandemic, which may not be this virus, it can be another uh, another virus. And so that, that's what we need to do, ensure that our health systems are robust, make sure that they are strong, mm -hmm. and make sure that we are able to what we call have a sustained management mm -hmm. of COVID-19 in order for us to be able, as you say, businesses back up, economies back up, children going to school, factories open, and so on and so forth. And so I think a very, very important question there. Thanks very much. Back to you, Lee. Thanks, Maria. And thanks, Babatunde, for adding those points as well. I mean, I think the other sort of obviously very closely related question that several people are asking, including Francisco Reyes, um, what conditions have to be met to consider the pandemic over? I mean, you partially answered it already. I think, Maria, we, you know, as you said, we would love nothing more than to say it's over. Right. But what would you like to add? Well, it, it's a great question. I mean, what we do at uh, WHO is we, you know, the director general declares a public health emergency of international concern. Um, and there are certain criteria that need to be met for this. And the fake, the public health emergency was declared on the 30th of January, 2020, mm -hmm. um, well before the virus became a pandemic or the situation became a pandemic. And what's critical about announcing a public health emergency is that you that's the highest level of alarm for countries to get ready, you know, to really take action so that we could potentially prevent a pandemic from happening. Um, the pandemic will take some time to end, but the emergency of COVID-19 could end this year. And what we're trying to do with our work, with all of our regional offices, our country offices, working with ministries, working with partners on the ground, with clinicians, with communities with people is really to end the emergency. Um, and what we mean by that is really taking the death and devastation out of COVID. And we can do that now with vaccines, with early diagnosis, with better clinical care. And we have a number of therapeutics, um, particularly for severe disease, but we have a number of antivirals that are recommended for earlier clinical care so that you know people can get the care early so that they don't progress to severe disease. So there will be conditions that will be met where the emergency is over. And that is being discussed um, through our emergency committee under the international health regulations. Um, they will make advice and provide advice to the director general, to Dr. Tedros, who will make that determination, who will make that decision. But unfortunately, we're not there. So, but for the people that are listening to this, this may you know, be discouraging, but I think what we want people to hear when they hear us speak is a sense of hope and a sense of that this will end, that is something we can say for sure. The problem is we can't say exactly when, but our this pandemic will end with our actions. And so all of us have a role to play. All of us have a role to play, no matter where you are, no matter what kind of job you have, no matter what your age, to get us closer to the end. And so what we wanna see is everybody really working hard, living their lives, but being careful so that we can get closer to the end of this emergency as well as ending the pandemic. Absolutely, thanks so much, Maria. So we've got more questions coming in as well, quite a lot of them still to do with um, vaccination, including this one from Bartholomew Gauray. Why do people still get the virus even after they're vaccinated? Maria? So it's a great, it's a good question. Um, so as we've said, the vaccines are incredibly protective again at, at preventing severe disease and death. At, at the need for you, you know, needing hospitalization or dying, but they're imperfect for preventing infection. Um, the vaccines were not designed to prevent all infections. They're doing a good job, um, but they don't prevent all infections. So it still is possible that after vaccination that you could um, be infected with the virus. However, your chance of developing severe disease and dying are significantly less with vaccination. So it is really important that you get vaccinated because it will save your life. 
um, and the lives of the people who are around you. Um, but this is also why we say vaccines and not mm -hmm. vaccines only. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to wear our masks. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to physical distance. We're continuing to invest in ventilation um, because the vaccines don't prevent all infections. So it's a combination of approaches. It doesn't also mean that we're going to be in masks forever. Uh, but for right now, we still need to wear this as the pandemic continues and as Omicron, which is this incredibly transmissible variant of concern, is circulating. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Maria. We have another question, um, again, from Rafi Bassano. This one for you, Babatunde. Some countries in the region have managed to keep infection at low levels. How long should this continue in order for them to say that COVID is on its way to becoming endemic? Um, or can that determination only be made by WHO? I think Maria's sort of partially answered that question, but if you wanted to add any specifics about the region, over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for that, Eve, and thanks for your question. Uh, I, I think, as we've said, um, the term endemic is really one where we don't want to emphasise too much. What we want to really emphasise is that we will need to continue with the current measures that we have in place. And so, as both Maria and I have said, vaccination is really, really, really important. But of course, it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. But full vaccination, one dose, depending on which vaccine you, uh, is being used in your particular area, or two doses, fully vaccinated. Uh, a booster dose um, as appropriate, but again, focusing on our elderly, those who are immunocompromised, as well as healthcare workers and other frontline workers. And it's really key and essential that we recognize that it's vaccination and public health and social measures, not either or, mm -hmm. it's both. Now, in terms of trying to have a sustained management or control of COVID-19, as we have said, while the virus is circulating anywhere in the world, we can still have an outbreak. So even if we bring it under control in this region, as long as it's circulating in Europe, America, or somewhere else, it can be introduced. Or it may be a pocket, as Maria, Maria has said, of unvaccinated people within your own country. And if you have that pocket of unvaccinated people, they can seed outbreaks in other parts uh, of, of the country. And that may lead to a surge, which is why we really need to have very good systems in place to be able to detect early, respond early, and contain that particular uh, outbreak. And so therefore, we, we do need to continue the measures that we have. Of course, it will be at a lower level because we are not, as Maria has said, we're not talking about a, a, a blanket approach where we say lock down everything. No, we don't do that anymore. What we have is a calibrated approach mm -hmm. so that people can have some measure of life, keep the schools open, keep the factories open, keep the businesses open and keep the economy going. Because we've already seen the impact of uncontrolled transmission of the virus, which has led uh, to um, uh, countries shutting down, businesses going bust, people not having jobs, and also, a, again, unfortunately, uh, many people are dying. And so we don't want that anymore. We really need to control, suppress transmission, and ensure vaccination. We call it the last mile. And so that last mile, identifying those people who have not been vaccinated and offering them the opportunity to be vaccinated in order to save not just themselves, but also others as well. Absolutely. We all have such an important role to play to protect the vulnerable. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it is around this individual uh, behaviour now, which is really, really important. So it, it's not just the government saying people should. It's now about individuals recognising that they should in order to protect their family, protect their community and to protect society. Thanks so much, Robert Sunday. We've got a question from Angela Arnold. Tell me more about long COVID. Very general question, but Maria, perhaps you can tell us what we know so far. Oh, this is a great question. I'm, I'm glad it was brought up um, because we, we probably should have included it in every single one of our answers going forward mm. because any future scenario of this virus, any future trajectory of this, we have to take into account post COVID-19 condition or long COVID. Um, we are really only starting to learn about this. 
Um, this is something that we have recognized, um, you know, since the beginning, really in the first six months, seven months of this pandemic, where people who had an acute infection, they had disease or even mild disease, were suffering from longer term effects. Um, and we are really beginning to understand this. We've been working with patient groups, with clinicians, many different types of medical professionals because the, this virus, we call it a respiratory virus, but it affects all organs of the body. It's really quite an incredible mm -hmm. virus. It causes incredible amount of disease. Um, Post-COVID condition, we have a definition for now. It's typically diagnosed after three months, three months after the initial disease or recovery from the initial disease. But this is just a case definition right now so that we could really understand it. We're in the process of understanding long COVID, um, recognizing it, um, doing research for it and providing appropriate rehab for individuals who suffer from this. What we know is that anyone uh, can, who's, who has been infected um, can have long COVID. Um, there are some estimates pre-Omicron that it was between one, in, one or two in 10 mm -hmm. people would suffer from this. Um, and it covers everything from extreme fatigue, um, loss of breath, um, cardiac conditions, longer term cardiac conditions, um, brain fog, mental health issues, it covers a lot. Um, but again, we don't know enough. So what we are looking at is making sure that we have cohort studies that are set up around the world, not just in high income countries, not just in the West, but all around the world so that we can follow individuals and understand what they're dealing with. And then we, we can provide the appropriate clinical care. What we do wanna say out there is if you are suffering from this, we understand it is real. Um, and we are working um, with guidance and with um, uh, governments and with clinicians to ensure that you get the proper care uh, that you need. We do also know that children can, can experience uh, post-COVID condition as well. So this is another reason why we want to protect you and you can take measures to protect yourself from infection as well as, as, well as developing severe disease. We know that vaccination reduces the risk of developing post-COVID condition, another reason to get vaccinated. Not only will vaccines save your life, but it'll also reduce the risk of developing post-COVID condition. So mm -hmm. we're learning a bit. We, we know a little bit. We don't have the full answers to this yet. Uh, but again, we're working with scientists and, and experts around the world to get a better handle on what this actually is and how we can provide the right type of care. Thanks so much, Maria. I know we're running short on time. I was just gonna squeeze in one or two more questions if we could. Um, one from Vika Fatafehi Lamoto. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name well. Um, what is the chance of getting COVID if you've already caught it before and are vaccinated? Probably difficult to quantify. <laughs> But what can we tell people about that? Well, I think that question should be yeah. answered. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is this is a, a question about um, reinfection if you have been infected mm. in the past. Um, we do know that people have been infected um, twice. Some people have been infected three times. Again, we're in the third year of this pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, the virus is spreading at really far too high of an intense level. Um, so there is a risk of reinfection. We don't have great rates of this, you know, in terms of giving a percentage. Um, it is quite low, I have to say, if we look at a, on a global scale in terms of the risk of reinfection. Um, there were some very good estimates that came out from Omicron looking at if you were infected with Delta, for example, or mm -hmm. Alpha, what was your risk of reinfection with Omicron? And there were some really good studies that came out mm -hmm. of South Africa um, showing that there was an increased risk of reinfection, but it was still quite, it was still quite low. Mm -hmm. um, Again, this is why we talk about uh, vaccines and, and not vaccines only. And so get vaccinated first and foremost, get vaccinated when it is your turn, fight for vaccine equity around the world. So those most at risk also have an opportunity to be vaccinated, but also be careful, be cautious. Um, there are a number of policies and around the world um, that are being lifted in terms of reducing, uh, taking away the use of masks or taking away physical distancing. And we as WHO, and I'm speaking with my global hat on, are wanting to make sure that people are cautious because the virus is still spreading. So wear your mask over your nose and mouth, keep your hands clean, keep yourself distanced, avoid crowds, spend more time outdoors than indoors if you can. And we're in this beautiful region here and I'm, I'm so happy to be in the warmth again because <laughs> I'm coming from the cold um, in, uh, from Switzerland. Um, just be careful, uh, you know, you can do things that will keep you safe 
And, and this is what we want to see. We want to see you safe. We want to see you living your lives. We want to see you alive. Great message. Um, I'm just going to squeeze in a lucky last one, if you will permit me. Um, our region spans above and below the equator. We've got some Northern Hemisphere. We've got some Southern Hemisphere. Um, parts of our region are experiencing the seasonal influenza at the moment. Um, so we've had a couple questions about um, vaccination against seasonal flu as well as COVID-19 um, and also whether that um, the risk changes for either COVID infection or flu infection if you if you have vaccine protection against either one of those. So that's a question from Angu Chun. Um, I don't know whether you want to have a go at that. Maria Valentinde? I'll, I'll have a go first. Okay, Maria, yeah. Maria, Over, maybe, away maybe, you go. I may want to add to that. Uh, and so uh, again, I don't think the message really changes. And I think uh, as Maria, Maria has said, vaccination is really, really key um, for COVID-19. Everybody should get vaccinated at the earliest opportunity or when it's their turn and ensure that they, they continue to, to protect themselves. We would also recommend that you get the seasonal influenza vaccine as well. Thanks so much, Babatunde. Any final words from you, Maria? No, I mean, it, it's, it's exactly as Babatunde said, get vaccinated for COVID-19, but also for influenza. I mean, the more people come, um, you know, are starting to circulate again and to mix, um, there are other viruses that are circulating and one of those is influenza. So we have tools against influenza. So if, if it is recommended in your country for you to get a, COVID, uh, a flu vaccine, please get vaccinated because it will protect you against flu. Um, and COVID-19 vaccines protect you against developing severe disease for COVID-19. So it's both. It's, it's not one or the other, it's both. Um, vaccines save lives, um, and, but they need to reach the people who need them. Um, and so there's a very big difference between vaccine and vaccination. Mm -hmm. And so what we are working towards is improving vaccination coverage around the world for COVID-19 as well as for influenza, mm -hmm. but making sure that we target those who are most at risk because vaccines save lives. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Thanks everybody who has joined us online, live, and anyone who's watching this back later. Um, you heard it here. We all have a really, really important role to play in doing everything that we can to protect ourselves, our families, our communities, the most vulnerable getting vaccinated and also continuing to take those protective measures that we know really help to reduce the risk of COVID, but also other diseases like influenza. So thanks everybody. Take care, stay safe and see you again soon.